Good evening, everybody. Glad to see everyone out tonight. It's going to be a wonderful <coughs> evening. Uh, lucky enough to be at, at dinner with him and uh, heard some great stories, and I think there's a, a deep well of stories yet to tell, so I'm looking forward to tonight. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Wendell White Memorial Lecture. We're privileged to have several endowed lecture series on this campus, but the Whiteman Lecture is one of the oldest and certainly among the most distinguished and meaningful of them. It further affirms the idea that Monmouth College is a place where important conversations take place. The Wendell Whiteman Memorial Lecture annually brings a noted business executive or scholar to our campus. It is named for Wendell Whiteman, a Monmouth College alumnus from the class of 1927 who worked for 50 years at Monmouth's Security Savings and Loan Association, including 24 years as its president. Following Wendell's passing, the Whiteman family established the lecture series in his memory. Former chairman and CEO of Caterpillar, Lee Morgan, was the featured speaker for the first Whiteman lecture in 1992. So yes, we are marking an important milestone in the history of the Whiteman Lecture, its 30th anniversary. Lee was also a member of the Monmouth Comp Board of Trustees. We're thrilled that this year's speaker, Mr. Tim Wells, also has strong ties to the college, having graduated from Monmouth 35 years ago. The fact that the Whiteman Lecture is named for and supported by a family, family of such importance to the college makes it even more meaningful. We are honored to have one of Wendell's three sons with us today. Monmouth College trustee Emeritus Ralph Whiteman, class of 1952, and his wife Martha. Please join me in expressing our appreciation. <laughs> Thank you all for making this special occasion possible and for all that your family, that you and your family have done for the college and for the city of Monmouth. It's now my privilege to introduce the introducer, one of Monmouth College's student leaders, Greg Dietrich, who will in turn introduce our speaker tonight. With him, he shares some similarities. They both came to Monmouth from communities not far from Peoria. They both played football for the Fighting Scots. They both have a background in hunting in the outdoors, and they both had experience with being relentless. Drake is a senior business administrator, administration major from Chillicothe, Illinois. He was captain of the football field of team last fall, where he earned first team all Midwest Conference honors as a linebacker. He's also a three-time member of the conference's all academic team. A regular honoree on the college's dean's list, Drake had a perfect 4-0 grade point average last fall. During breaks from his time as a stellar student athlete at Monmouth, Drake can be found working outside where he's held positions with the local park district and with the Rice Pond Hunting Preserve. In his latter role, he was part of a team responsible for transitioning a farm into a functional hunting ground. With the park district, he worked independently to maintain the grounds at nine different properties and was part of conservation and cleanup efforts. Drake has also held an internship with B. Relentless, there's a connection, training in sports performance in Morton, Illinois, working not only with clients but also with the owner on issues related to business strategy and operation. And as I heard through the grapevine the day before yesterday, probably one of Drake's greatest accomplishments and certainly one that his uh, family is uh, proud and relieved of is he is newly employed and uh, will start work about a month after graduation. So I'm pleased to call to the to the podium to introduce our speaker, Mr. Drake. Good evening. It is my privilege to introduce this year's Wendell Whiteman Memorial Lecturer. Relentless Pursuit is a title of the television show that Tim Wells chose and is also an accurate description of what has led to the considerable success that brings him back to his alma mater today. Six includes receiving the prestigious Gold Moose Award for the best outdoor host six years running. 
Tim has taken his passion of being an outdoorsman and combined it with an entrepreneurial spirit and plenty of drive and determination to create content that is viewed more than half a billion times annually. He comes from a long way from his early days of chasing birds and squirrels on a farm near Canton, Illinois. But he's also stayed true to his roots and he's still based in Canton today. He stayed true to his principles for his love of God, for family, and for conservation. I enjoyed a quote I read recently in a story about him. He said, this is country. I'm a country boy and I'm no better than the next guy. I just got lucky enough to find myself in a situation where I can film what I do and show you what happens. Tonight, we are lucky enough to have him back here at Monmouth, the college he graduated from in 1987. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to back to this year's Whiteman Lecturer, Mr. Tim Wells. Thanks, buddy. Enjoy. Wow, this is great. Come back home. Walked around today, got to see uh, a lot of friends and, you know, some buildings that weren't here before, and it's all spiffy and looking good now. Then I walked out on the, the track, and there was my track coach, still track, track, doing his track thing, man. Same attitude, same smile, everything. Nothing's changed, man. He did, I, I wanted to throw the javelin, but I didn't get the chance, so we'll have to do that another day, Raj. But uh, thanks for coming tonight. I even see some, some of my old classmates and teammate Bootsy's out here. We got uh, a lot of good people in the audience to see some farmers, and who all knows what, what else is here. We got one of my hometown boys, actually, one of your football players. It's amazing that everybody showed up. You know, Monmouth College, I'm going to put my glasses on because I have aged a little, but Monmouth College, man, wow, what a beautiful place this has become. You know, it's, uh, it didn't look like this when I was here. I lived across the street, and uh, it was more like, mm, kind of like a Motel 6, but that was like the Taj Mahal for me because, see, I had grown up in Canton, Illinois at the end of a dirt road, lived in a, uh, a trailer home had a little bit of a basement under that my dad tried to build for us, and uh, we were farm kids. And uh, so when I came to Monmouth College, it, this was something special. Heck, you could go through the lunch line here twice if you wanted to. You could eat all you want. It was, it was great. We had a TV in my room. I was the only one in my dorm. That was perfect. And uh, one of my dorm mates, he, uh, he bought uh, cable TV. That was a big deal. So he got cable, and then another kid knew how to hook into it, so everybody in the dorm had cable TV until the cable guy found out. And that, that was, that's another situation. But, uh, man, it's good to be back. And, uh, you know, I was talking over uh, dinner tonight with, with some, of, uh, some of the faculty about how things have changed. When I stayed in my dorm back in them days, I had a 12-gauge shotgun up against the, the wall in, in my bedroom. I had a bow and arrow in there. About once a week, I'd pull the bow out, and we'd shoot arrows out in the middle of the, the campus there, and the girls would stand around and watch, and some, some of the guys would try my arrows. Sometimes an arrow would go wild and fly across the street, or we'd take a pot shot at a squirrel or something. So t times have changed, haven't they? <laughs> And, uh, you know, I one afternoon after, uh, I think it was, I, I played sick and didn't go to football practice. I went deer hunting instead. I went up north and uh, killed a big buck out north of town here and brought him back. And I'd cinched him up on the side of the dorm and up the side Gibson outside my, my room there. And he, there was a nice place I could hook the deer on outside my door. So I, I pulled the deer up there. We had gutted him right there in front of the uh, right in front of the dorm and all the girls were grossed out and the guys were really liking it you know it was good we were gonna have a big cook so I put that deer up there and he was hanging and it was neat until the next morning when there was a knock on my door and I opened the door and there there was the Dean of Students and I knew at the time I wasn't worried about the deer there were some other things I was hoping he wasn't at my dorm for but uh, come to find out he just wanted to get his picture with the deer so <laughs> So we got that taken care of, and uh, that was kind of my story back when I was coming here. But you know, at Monmouth College, this was uh, the place, you know, we were full of rednecks, and a lot of us were, you know, farmers, and on the weekend, we'd have to go home and maybe, you know, pick some corn or plow field or work with the cattle or something and be back on Monday. But, uh, you know, we liked to be here on Friday night because there was a lot of things we liked to chase here, too. And uh, that was part of the fun. And, uh, you know, right out, the, w w made some great friends. You know, the, there was a lot of people here from Chicago, and I'm, I'm sure there still is. 
and uh, there's probably a lot of people here from the Quad Cities, maybe some students. Is there any students in, the, in here from the, one of the big schools or from the big towns, cities? Raise your hand if you are. Are you from Chicago, Quad Cities, Galesburg maybe? Okay, so you guys don't know how to dance. Because uh, only uh, back then, only us country boys could dance, you know. And then we laughed at the city boys the way they dance. They would shuffle their feet and stuff. They looked like Michael ja Michael J Jackson and stuff, and that was kind of odd for us. But I had one buddy that I met, and uh, Roger will remember him, uh, Frank Prokop. He ended up being the pilot for uh, the president back in the day. And uh, but he left school here. But him and I are good friends still to this day. But. He was a city boy, and uh, we, we hit it off right, right out of the gate. He was a good friend of mine and still is, but, you know, he, he liked my cowboy boots, and I liked his girlfriend. <laughs> and uh, I could never convince him to trade, but, you know, he, I did let him wear my boots one night. And he was a city boy, and I, I'll never forget going to uh, one of the frat parties. I had talked him into, he, he thought he looked cool in the boots, but I told him, I said, you'll look a lot cooler if you tuck your pants in the boots. You don't put them over them, you know, and he believed me. So all night long, every, all the country boys, we were all laughing at Frank as he's dancing with his, you know, you know. So I, I had some great times at Monmouth and, you know, walking around, some of the memories come back. You know, when I look at Monmouth College, it was a wild and crazy time at, at times, you know. But it was also a time where, you know, if you left Monmouth College, which was my goal when I got here, you, it really meant something, you know, if you had a degree from Monmouth College, you know. Uh, you see, Mammoth. It, it was a it was a man builder. It was a, a woman builder. It was uh, a place where students, you know, we focused on goals and uh, where we could dream big. You know, to say you were a, a Mammoth College grad was quite an honor, and it still is today for me. I'm very proud of that. It was a, a winning atmosphere. You know, the faculty here, you know, whether they were coaches or teachers. Uh, they were architects. They they uh, they laid the path for us, and uh, you know they produced some some amazing characters from what they had to work with. Anyway, you know there was uh, architects, you know, of the roads that led us to our future and to our dreams, and and it, it came together. And sure enough, it worked. I mean, there's lawyers and doctors, Fortune 500 uh, executives, coaches, teachers. There's preachers. You know, they were all spawned here at Monmouth College. I'm thankful for that, and I'm glad to be here tonight, and I feel very, very honored to, that you let me come and talk. You know, although Monmouth is now a much more pristine place, and it's very beautiful to walk around, and you can see the influx of, of uh, graduates' money, uh, it, it's really quite a campus to look at. You know, and it's a, it's a lavish landscape. And uh, I just, uh, I still hope that the school is the same school that, you know, I went to because uh, for it's here, it's where I began my dreams. And so, you know, one of the things I want to talk about, you know, there's a lot of students here that are seniors that are getting ready to go on. And there's some of us in here that are older than I am. And I, I think, Frank, I sat with him at, at dinner. He's so old that I'll talk as fast as I can so he gets all the speech. Um, you there, buddy? He was picking on me the whole, whole dinner. So, so, you know, success in life, and I was asked to talk about my success in business and stuff, and I, I would like to, you know, I wrote some things down so that I didn't forget, but planning your success at a young age is critical. You know, my plan at the, as I was here was just to graduate. You know, if, if I could graduate from Monmouth College, the rest was going to be history as far as I knew. I had my ticket. And uh, that in itself was no easy task for me, let me tell you. I pretty much cheated my way through high school, to tell you the truth. I just did what I had to do to get through the classes, and that wasn't going to fly at Monmouth College. And, you know, and not a lot of people knew this. Uh, well, maybe the faculty did. Maybe they kept it quiet, but um, I never told nobody. I sure didn't tell my mom and dad, but the first semester I was here, sure as sure, sure shooting, I got caught cheating. Mrs. Holkgren, which was my favorite teacher, had caught me cheating on a paper, unbeknownst to me. Now, when you say cheating, you know, that's not looking at the neighbor's paper, but, you know, this was a bad one because when I, she told me to come into her office, and when I came into her office the next morning, she had this paper laying on the, t on the table. Well, that's the one that I had turned in. Well, she told me, she said, Tim, do you know what plagiarism is? And I said, nope. And she said, well, that means 
and she opened a book and she showed me and she said, you copied what this guy wrote and that's called stealing and you can get kicked out of school for this. And I looked at her and I said, Mrs. Holkern, I didn't cheat and I didn't plagiarize. And she looked at me and she was like, how can he lie to me like this? And I said, I am being completely honest with you. I paid that girl to write a good paper for me and I had no idea that she plagiarized because I had to go home and pick corn for my dad and I didn't have time to do it. She tried not to smile, but I could tell she had a little bit of a sense of humor and she took it and, and let me off the hook with an F. And I didn't get kicked out of school. I got a, a C in her class and to this day, wherever Mrs. Holtgren is, I appreciate what she did for me because it probably saved my life. But uh, that was one of my stories from back in the day. And, and uh, she was definitely an architect that helped send me down the road and she straightened me up. But from that point on, I knew I was going to have to learn if I was going to graduate from Monmouth College and I was going to have to do some studying. And it was tough. I mean, they cracked the whip. They may still crack, crack the whip now, but you had, to, you had to put your time in. You had to study. And some of us that didn't didn't want to study. Well, they went to Western later the next semester, and that's where they ended up. So, But uh, in the end, you know, that day came where I actually did graduate, and uh, that was a big deal for me. It was a big deal for my whole family, and uh, it, uh, it did me a lot of good. You know, dreams are, are, are a funny thing, and, and as we think about our life and what we want to achieve in life, there's only so many opportunities in life to make it happen. And you have to be focused. And when I got out of college, I said to myself, I just want to be able to hunt and fish the rest of my life. But my goal is to figure out a way to do that. And with this degree, when I leave, I'm going to do it. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I, know, I knew that success meant I could be free. You see, I lived with my mom and dad on a little farm, and my mom tried to sell real estate a little bit, and my dad was a teacher, and they didn't pay teachers a lot back then, but my dad would work from dawn till dusk. If he, would, he would work before he had to go teach school, he would work after school till dark, and that went on as long as I could rem remember as a little boy, and I told myself, even though I worked all through high school with my dad helping him farm and everything, I said, this is too much hard work. I got to figure out a way to get out of this. So I set my goal to be wealthy enough so that I didn't have to work like my dad worked so hard. And bless his heart, I mean, he was a hard worker. But uh, so when I got out of college, I got my first job and off I went. I went to Keystone Steel and Wire. That was a big deal, man. I got a foreman job and then here I was about 19, 20 years old, got a foreman job, walked into the steel mill, and in about five hours I realized this ain't gonna be easy either. But they paid me $17,000, and wow, that wasn't a lot of money even back then, but it was enough to get by. But I thought, you know, for $17,000, I'll be able to make my way up and do a good job and maybe make a lot of money one day. But back in the day, nepotism was pretty rampant in a lot of these old time factories and so forth. And nepotism at the time at Keystone Steel and Wire was a big deal. My uncle worked there as well. And he had been there his, most of his life. As a matter of fact, he was ready to retire and he didn't make much more money than I did. And I soon realized that if I am going to achieve my goal of being successful financially and being free so I can hunt and fish for a living, it's probably not gonna happen in this place. And that's where it brings me to face your fears. You know, when you get out of school, if you want to, you want to achieve your, your goal of being successful, maybe it's financially or, uh, you know, it's, it could be being a great father. It could be being a great preacher. It don't matter. if Whatever your goal is to be successful, there's going to be times where it's scary. And uh, it's a tough world out there. And uh, I had to face my fears. So... You know, when I was little, my dad installed in me that you have to try to face your fears, you know, and uh, to find success, you will, you will put yourself in situations where you don't want to do what you got to do, but it's going to hurt, so you might as well do it, or you're not going to achieve your goals. Fear is a human trait. It protects us from harm. 
You know, uh, the greatest soldiers that ever fought for America, you know, they were, they were afraid, but they were more courageous than afraid. And uh, my dad always made me face my, my fears as I was little. I was afraid of snakes. I was deathly afraid of snakes when I was little, but he made me handle them. And, uh, you know, he would take the non-venous snakes and he would, he, would, he would ease me into it. And eventually, I, I like playing with snakes now. I mean, I don't mind them and, and it worked. But, you know, when I was little, there was one thing that I was most afraid of, and that was the monster that lived in my closet in my bedroom. I never seen him, but I knew he was there, and he really was, uh, he was out to eat me. He wanted to eat me eventually, and up until I was about four years old, I knew he was in there, and I tell you, every night when I would go to bed, I would, you know, he wouldn't come out if the lights were on, so I would, I would when I walked in my room, I'd flip the light on in my bedroom, and then I would walk over to my bed, and I would unmake the bed, I would pull the blanket back and put the pillow up against the wall. And then I would back out into the hallway and come storming in the room as fast as I could, hit the light on the way by and dive into my bed and get the covers over my head as quick as I could. And uh, that went on for, I don't know, maybe a year or two. But but I I finally, one day, I broke down and told Dad. I said, Dad, is there any way you can come downstairs with me and, you know, tuck me in bed and and maybe uh, look in the closet, see if that monster's in there tonight so I can sleep without the blanket over my head. And I could, you know, it probably surprised my dad, but I, even though I was little, my dad, I remember my dad telling me, he said, you know what? That same monster lived in my closet. And he said, you know, that monster, he's in there tonight, Tim. And he said, that monster is going to be in all your closets as long as you live, unless you go in there in the dark and let him know you're not afraid. And when you do that, the monster will leave. Well, I didn't go in there the first night. It took a few days. But I got so sick of being afraid that finally one night I got out of my bed, walked over to that closet door. I stood there for a moment. But then I opened the door, and I walked inside that door, and I closed that door, and I stood there for a little bit, getting ready to take my medicine, but it never came. And after that, I was over my fear. You know, you have to face your fears. And uh, when I got out of... Uh, when I got out of Keystone, I decided to go for it. I wanted to try to sell real estate. I wanted to buy it and sell it because I knew you could make money at that. My mom did it a little bit with houses, and I thought, I'm going to do that. So I faced my fear, and sure enough, I, was ignore- or I went and bought my first house. And uh, I fixed it all up. It took three months, and uh, I sold it three months later, and I lost $3,200 in two months of work. At the time, it was a brutal loss. The road to success is never easy. And on that road, you'll have flat tires and sometimes you'll crash. But you've got to keep on going, man. You've got to just keep on trying. Do you know Babe Ruth hit 714 home runs? But most people don't know that he held the record at the time for strikeouts. 1,300 of them. But you know, if you're going to be a winner in life, and you're going to succeed. If you want to meet your goals and live that dream that you're hoping for, you got to swing for the fences or you'll never get there. you got to realize that you will fall at some point in your life. You're going to fall down. you got to strive to get back up and succeed. And when it happens, you want to embrace it. You want to pull it into your mind and realize what you did wrong. Learn from your mistake and get up and go again. The road to the top is full of bumps. You're going to hit them, but you've got to keep on going. You know, as a child, I was afraid that I would die if I went in that closet, but I faced my fears, and I got through it, and I learned from my mistakes. But if you fall enough and you, you continue to try, as I did when I got out of school, eventually you start learning. And you master the art of achieving your goal of success, whatever it may be. And when you do, it comes to another point. When it's time to strike, you want to strike when the iron is hot. And less than a year ago, I bought a farm. My whole life, I've been trading real estate. And um, every time, I'm a little bit afraid of that monster in the closet. 
But about a year ago, I bought a farm, and uh, it was 500 acres. It's the biggest farm I'd ever bought. And uh, it, was, it was almost $2 million. And, uh, but I looked at it, and it looked right. Everything was good about it. When, what I had looked at in real estate my whole life, and I said, I should buy this. And I talked to my wife, and she said, you're wrong. You shouldn't buy that. Well, my wife, you know, I make the money, and my wife keeps the money. So I thought, you know, either way, whether I make money or don't make money on this deal, she gets it all anyway, so I bought the farm. And uh, I took a big chance. You know, you have to, if you've, once you're seeking success in your life, whatever your field is, and you know when the time is right, you've got to strike. Even though you may be afraid, that might be the time when it changes your life. And it may happen next year, whatever you've been waiting for, or it may happen the year after that. Or you may have to wait till you're almost 60 years old like me for when you get those big moments. But it can happen if you're willing to, to, to dive when the time has come. And I sold that farm last month and made almost a million dollars. And so I would have never made that if I would have listened to the fear in the closet. And it was a big hit for me, a bigger one than I've ever had in real estate. But it finally happened. But as I was maturing in, in, uh, in, in throughout my life with real estate deals and doing those things, when I was about 30 years old by that time, out of college, I, have a, I had two uh, oil lube changes, quick lube changes. I had a, a welding school, and I owned a consulting firm with 26 uh, employees that all we did was go around to the schools and, and design the system to remove their asbestos. I was thumping away, man. It was great. I was successful. I had my, uh, my vision was locked on to success, but I had forgot my dream because my dream was to hunt and fish. And that's all I wanted to do. But now I finally realized I'm 30 years old and I'm working 12 hours a day and I'm digging in the dirt just like my dad did. And I said, I have to stay focused. So I started writing articles for hunting and fishing and the magazines bought them from me. The National, uh, the Bow Hunting Magazine, Bow Hunter Magazine, North American Whitetail, Buckmaster Magazine, they were publishing my articles, but they didn't pay nothing. I mean, they paid a little bit, but it wasn't enough to feed my dogs. But at least I was getting back into the mode where my goal was and to live my life doing what I like to do. You know, you have to believe in yourself if you're ever going to be successful. When everyone else is gone, it's just you and you. And so you've got to believe in yourself and you've got to have faith that you can do it. And that was the hardest part of the whole endeavor of becoming successful and living my dream. So by the time I was 30, I was pretty good at shooting my bow. My fingers, uh, well, the days that I would have a, a time to, to shoot my bow, I was in the backyard shooting until my fingers would practically bleed. It was, it was uh, my passion. I could shoot a blowgun and throw a boomerang. And uh, thanks to my coach in Monmouth College, I could chuck a spear like no one else. And that's how I hunted. But it was one day that while I was between work, it was a Sunday afternoon, and I went down to Springfield, Illinois. There was a whitetail uh, deer classic where people came, and they bought all kind of hunting goods and stuff like that. And when I walked in there, there was a man, and he was sitting at his, uh, at his table, and he was selling something that everybody was buying. And I got to looking, and I looked, and there were hunting videos, VHS videos. I mean, everything was foggy on the screen because it was VHS back in the day. And they were handing him $20 bills as fast as he could take them. Cha-ching. The light came on. I said, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to film. I don't know how to edit. But I know that's how I'm going to show the world what I can do. And that's where I'm going to, to take the chance and do what I've waited my whole life to do. So I came home and I told my wife, we're selling the quick lubes. And I sold all the quick lubes. And I sold my welding school. And I sold my consulting firm. And I took a year and a half off. And I scheduled hunts all around the world. And I traveled to Africa. And I went to New Zealand. I went to Argentina. I shot doves from the air with my bow. I, had, I could always do that, but no one knew. But I had found my niche now. And my friends followed me around. I had to pay their way, obviously. 
It was expensive. The African hunts were very expensive, and I was going through the money fast. All the money I had saved in real estate was going away quickly. I would do another real estate deal if I would see one along the way, but I was too busy hunting. I wanted to make my, my way hunting and fishing. So a year and a half had gone by. All the daylight hours I was hunting around the world in the evenings I was learning how to edit. It was really hard, but I didn't want someone else editing my stuff. I wanted it to look like my way. I wanted to show it how I wanted it. And after a year, I came out with my first video. It was called Lethal Flight. Uh, some of you guys may remember that video. And we, we, booked a, a, we booked a booth. I remember it was $320 for the booth. And my wife and I, she was pregnant at the time, we got all my videos. I made a thousand of them. And uh, we brought several of them to the show and we set up our little booth. We had some pictures and some of my deer heads on the wall and my adrenaline was running. I was like, oh man, here we go. Let's see how this goes. Well, my wife was helping me, but the only way she would help me is if she could sell Beanie Babies while she was there. So Beanie Babies were hot at the time. What could I say, you know? So she brought a big box of Beanie Babies. She was on one end of my table with her Beanie Babies, and I was on the other with a stack of videos with a TV plan with Lethal Flight on it. And when they opened the doors, in come the hunters. And in come the hunters with their families. And when they spotted the Beanie Babies, here come the kids. And they were stacked around the table. But the longer they were stacked, the more their dad started watching the TV and seeing what I was doing. They seen doves shot out of the air with a bow and arrow. They saw a grizzly shot between the eyes with an arrow and he dropped in his tracks. They saw some crazy guy throwing spears at wild hogs. And they started buying my videos. And before I knew it, there were, there were, they were lined up 25 people deep waiting to buy my lethal flight video. And to this day, Lethal Flight was the number one video sold in America. 520,000 of them. It was a big success. And I had took a chance that could have cost me everything I'd worked for. But I was just getting started. It was just getting started. Because after I had made the video and that, that followed, next came a call from a guy named Wade Sherman. Wade Sherman owned a little company that he started called the Outdoor Channel. And he said, hey, I've seen your Lethal Flight video. I'd sure like you to make me a TV show. Wow, that sounded good. So the next thing I did, I said, if I'm going to make a TV show that airs nationally, I'm going to build it the best they've ever seen. And I'm going to do stuff that no one else does. So I started, once again, I started to travel. I went to Africa. I went to Argentina. I went to Mozambique. And it almost ended really quick because one day I was ended up in South Africa. I was crawling up this mountain. I was trying to cut this line of, uh, of uh, blue wildebeest. They were, they were following each other and they were going up the mountain. And at the top of the mountain, there was a plateau. And I knew if I could get up there and get ahead of them, the wind was blowing this way. I had to get ahead of them before they hit my wind and I could get the shot. And as I was going up the mountain, I, it was a lot of big boulders, and it was really hot that day, and the, the rocks were laying everywhere, and I, I threw my bow over the top of uh, a rock, and when I pulled myself up to get ahead of them, the, they were still coming up the mountain. I was ahead of them now, and I was almost to the top. I had to pull myself over, and when I pulled myself over, there was, the sun was kind of in my face. There was something in front of me, though, and it was up in the air, and it was swaying like this. It was about a foot from my face. And I kind of looked to the side to get the sun out of my eyes, and there was the deadliest snake in, in all of Africa, a black mamba, and he was ready to strike me in the face. A black mamba, when they strike you, you've got about 20 minutes. And it was about an hour walk back to camp. And I, I remember that moment that when you feel the adrenaline run through your body when you face death like that. And all I could do was just stand there motionless and I was at his mercy. And that snake looked back at me for the longest time and then finally it coiled back down and slithered off. And I'll never forget that moment. 
And after that moment, there were several times throughout my life where, for some reason, it always happened in Africa, but it got dangerous at times. But time passed, and I was, my show was starting to take off. And you know, in life, when you become successful, there's going to be other people that are competing with you that really want to knock you down. And I was kind of naive to it, and I should have been more sensible because all the people in the industry that do what I do, basically we, you know, to put it bluntly, we kill things for a living. And those are the kind of people that I was dealing with, you know. Uh, and uh, one of my peers that was, had a pretty good show, and he was an older guy at that point, and I always looked up to him, and I kind of wanted to model myself after him, but not. But one day I walked up to that guy, and I said, man, I really wanted to meet you, and I appreciate everything you do, and, you know, I'm trying to, you know, get in the industry and, and get my TV show off the ground and so forth. And he looked at me, and he said, yeah, I've seen some of your stuff. He said, you'll never make it in the hunting industry. He said, I can see right off you don't have what it takes. And I tell you what, it, it was almost like he gutted me right there. I went home and I was thinking to myself, what have I done? Why have I taken this chance? Why have I risked everything to do this? But the more I thought about it, the more pissed off I got. And I said, you know what? I'm going to show this guy and everyone else that's been saying the same thing to me. And I made it my quest to produce the best television show that ever hit the hunting industry. Well, shooting forward now, it was four or five years later that my show was thumping. I was one of the top rated shows in the nation. I had just received the, no, the, no, uh, the nomination for host of the year. And I was, I'll never forget it, uh, Donald Trump was on stage at Las Vegas and I was in this huge auditorium filled from the brim wall to wall people and I was up for host of the year the biggest award it was like the, the uh, it's called the Golden Moose Awards and that's like the Academy Awards of the outdoor channels of all the outdoor productions the TVs uh, the fishermen the, the hunters all alike and I was sitting in that auditorium and and I was the last one, the final thing of the night that they were going to give, you know, the award to. And Donald Trump was standing on stage and he was talking and everybody was in awe. He was about to be president. and That was over and then they said, okay. And they, they were about to announce the host of the year. And my mama cried when they called my name. And, uh, you know, when I walked up on that stage, I'll never forget it. I mean, I remember all the smiling faces, and I remember seeing my, my family, and it was a big deal. But I remember seeing that guy in the back of the room. And I remember seeing his face, the same guy that told me I'd never make it in the outdoor industry. So, so to make a long story short, five years later, you know, I had won six in a row. And uh, no one uh, in the hunting industry has ever done that. And it's a tribute for... You know, it was a long road, but I paid my dues and I, I faced my fears. And as you set your goals in life and you, you leave school and you say, I'm going to do this, it's not going to be easy, but you can do it. I did it. And if a kid from Canton, Illinois can do it, there's no one in this room that can't find success. And you can live your dream. But you got to be willing to fight. You know, business is hard. And uh, you got to be an alpha if you want to win. I learned early on that success in life, you know, you can't settle for participation awards. You know, go for the gold or go home if you want success, if you want to live your dream. Don't run with the pack. You've got to lead the pack. And, you know, the alpha wolf, he always, uh, he always eats first and he sires the most young. I wanted to be an alpha and it, and it took a lot of beating to get there. You know, I, I spent 37 days in Canada one year trying to film a wolf hunt, the most cunning animal alive. And about day 10, I was at the top of this, this valley that overlooked a big frozen lake. There was about three foot of fresh snow on the ground and the wind was howling. And I was about to give up. Uh, it was almost dark when I noticed a string of animals coming across the lake. And I pulled my binoculars up. I was bow hunting. And I noticed it was a pack of wolves. 
There was 12 or more animals. And as the wolves made their way across the lake, they were weaving in and out, but one wolf led the entire pack. And as they followed him, it became apparent who was the alpha. It's not that he was a larger animal, any stronger than the rest or anything, but he carried dominance, and you could tell he was the alpha. For when he would stop, they would all stop. He'd look around, they would look around, and then he'd pick up and walk again. Finally, they came up to the carcass, and as I watched, I could see the the alpha. He went into the, the, the carcass first, and he fed on the moose. As he started to feed, some of the females came in, and they started to feed next. And then two young males came in, and he backed out, and instantly the fight was on. And they... The two males, the two young males fought with the alpha, and you could tell they were, it was violent, it was real, it wasn't a mock battle. They were, they were rolling and biting and snarling and fighting, and as fast as it started, then it was over. And the, and the alpha stood over one of the young males, and the other one cowered back and stood back. The alpha stood his ground. And if you're going to be a winner in life, and you're going to fight to, to make success, you're going to sometimes have to fight and do what it takes to stay the alpha. And it's going to be, for me anyhow, sometimes it was very expensive. Sometimes it was painful. Because the alpha, when he was finished, he had won, and he went back to the carcass. But as he did, he limped really heavy, and I could see him carrying one of his feet as he went back. But to be an alpha, you have to be willing to fight when the time comes. Not only will you have to be willing to fight, but you're going to have to be able to ignore the, the naysayers. You know, from the time you leave the cradle, if you're playing football, somebody's going to tell you you're not good enough or someone's going to tell you the other guy's better than you. Same goes with you're trying to get through law school or you're trying to get a job at one of the big companies in town that has three or four other people vying for the same position. You have to believe in yourself. You have to go for it. You should be the first guy in the office in the morning. And you should be the guy that turns the light off when you leave if you want to be the, the president of your company. There's no room for losers in this world. And nobody's entitled to anything. If you give it your all, if you give it a relentless pursuit, you can meet your dreams, though. And you can live them. I found that... Uh, in life, you know, as I traveled along, there was a lot of things that were happening, opportunities. You know, you, it, you only had a little bit of opportunity to do this or that. And if you didn't seize the moment, if you ignored or you weren't patient, you know, or you were too patient and you let the, the moment pass, someone else grabbed the, grabbed the idea or someone else got ahead of you with, you know, their plan. Facebook showed up, Instagram and YouTube. One thing my dad had taught me, take the shot when you get it. Don't wait. When he gives you the shot, take the shot. And I applied that to my business plan. And when YouTube came along on the scene, I started to feed the machine. Not only did I have my show on national television, but I was one of the few television hosts that denied the producers of the Outdoor Channel to have exclusivity to my content. In other words, I could use my content wherever I wanted to, over and beyond TV. So after I aired it there, I would put it on YouTube. Now today, my YouTube is the, the most seen YouTube channel in the bow hunting industry. Of all the bow hunting channels you watch, my YouTube channel has just under a million uh, subscribers, but it's watched worldwide. Also, I had done the same thing with Facebook. The instant that Facebook allowed me to put my videos on there, we started feeding the animal. And the, the algorithms of, of Facebook are unique. For the most part, hunters are uh, conservative people, of which Facebook is not really a conservative platform. And uh, they try to hush us a little bit. So they have the algorithm that controls that. And so they watch the wording and anything we do so that they can, can subdue anything we say that may sound conservative. And I've tiptoed around that. I actually hired a consultant that said, don't say these words. Don't show this at this moment. And you will avoid the algorithm and they can't shield you. Last month, we did 65 million views on Facebook. 
We're approaching half a billion views this year just with Facebook platform with my videos. It's pretty humbling to know that. You know, I, uh, I've always wanted to swing for the fence, like I said. And uh, if you don't swing for the fence when you die someday, you know what we've done in life will echo in eternity. And I don't want to lay in my deathbed someday and look back and say, what if? And when you leave school, when you leave Monmouth College, one of the best universities in, in Illinois, set your goal and set a plan. And when you're my age, don't ever look back and say, if only I would have done this, or if only I would have taken that chance. Now's the time to plan and succeed. So I leave you with this. You know, dreaming is easy, uh, but sex, success is hard. Even so, I promise you that, you know, your dreams are worth fighting for. The trials of life, they beat us down. And dreamers are some, sometimes forced to settle for less. But if you, if you forget everything I said today, try to remember this, that when you feel like you want to quit, don't. Because someday you'll look back on your life and you'll wonder to yourself, what if? And so never drop your sails. Instead, you know, when the storm hits, cruise right into it and just keep fighting. When you fall down, pick yourself up and go again. Never drop your sail despite how fierce the storm might be. You know, what we, uh, what we do next is uh, never, you never know the results, but you always know that you can know that if you keep trying, eventually it will go your way. You have to be willing to walk into the office, like I said, at first in the morning if you're going for, an, for a, a, a job in big business and be the last one out the door. You got to pay your dues. Today's generation, a lot of us, and hopefully not the mom of college grads, want instant gratification. They think they deserve that big job right out of school that pays $100,000. That's not the case. You've got to pay your dues. You know, it's, it's, in business, it's a lot like the weight room. You should jog into that weight room. You work that iron so hard that you've got to crawl back out of the place. It's the same in business. It's the same in TV. It's the same in hunting. The greatest hunters are the guys that stayed the distance. I've many times, I have woke up in the dark and looked around and said, where am I? Because I was so exhausted from the day's hunt where I had laid down in the evening and then woke up not knowing where I was. I've hunted till my, I thought my feet were gonna fall off tracking animals in Africa. But in the end, it was rewarding, it paid off and I've lived my dream. So in the end, if you're willing to live a relentless pursuit, your dreams will definitely come true. You know, you never know what, what life is gonna pitch at you. The last time I, I was in Africa, next to the last time, I was in a tree stand that wasn't really a tree stand. I crawled up in a tree, I was spear hunting, and there was a little water hole where where the animals had come and I could see the sign, it was everywhere. And so I, I had to pack in about oh, a 45 minute walk and I carried as much bait in as I could. I took fresh alfalfa and little pellets and I had it in my backpack and I had two spears in my hands. I had all my portable cameras. Uh, I use a little uh, a switch on my wrist so when I place these cameras and they point every direction. When the animals get near where I'm spear hunting, then I hit record and I capture all these crazy cool angles. I strap spear, uh, camera, little tiny cameras on my spears so that when I throw the spear, you go with the spear. It's pretty unique. Nonetheless, I, was, I climbed into this tree real close to the water hole and I put this bait underneath my tree. I was about 15 feet off the ground and I was kind of wedged on one limb and standing on the other and I made my weight. Because in Africa, the animals there have a unique sense of smell. They can pick up the smell of water and bait maybe a mile away. And their, their daily routine is to look for something to eat. And that's how you hunt them. That's the way the natives have hunted for years is 
they would break limbs off trees and throw the fresh leaves on the ground and the animals would come to eat them and they'd throw their spears. And that's basically what I was doing. So I got up in the tree and got up in there and got ready and uh, I kind of stretched out a little bit. And when I did, one of my cameras that I had on the tree limb flipped off and it fell to the ground. And I was like, oh, the doggone it. And the, deer, the, the animals, the impala and the warthogs, these animals, they, anything unnatural on the ground, they'll see it. So I started to climb down the tree, and I got about halfway down the tree, and my boot slipped. And when my boot slipped, I shook the tree. And the tree was only about this big around. And I shook it. Well, when I shook it, I had made a big mistake before I climbed down because my spear was razor sharp. And I had stuck it on a limb pointing down. And when I shook that tree, I shook the spear free. And I had no idea it was coming down on me. It hit the top of my hat, and my, my leg was on a tree limb like this, and I was holding, and when it hit the top of my hat, it just missed the front of my nose and came down and went in the top of my thigh and came out the bottom of my thigh. And I was standing there with that spear through my leg, and I held the spear Im immediately. I didn't want it to shift side to side because I had made my spears razor sharp. So exactly that's what they would do, penetrate deep. And as I held the spear... I could feel the rush of adrenaline going through my body, and I knew that it was a very, you know, it was a lethal hit. That hit will kill an animal, and I knew it was now in my body. And so I had put, it was an gen ingenious idea. I decided to put little hooks on my spear so when they went in animals, they didn't come back out. That way when the animal runs, the spear moves around and, and takes the animal out much faster, and there's less suffering or anything. It kills the animal quick. Well, now those hooks are in my flesh under my, in, in my leg. But I'm almost 10 feet above the ground, and above my head, another t five or six feet, is my water and my radio. And as I tried to go up that tree with that spear sticking out of my head, my, my leg, I couldn't hardly move my leg, and I knew I couldn't get up. But I knew I couldn't get down because if I tried to go down, that spear is going to wobble left or right and cut my leg in half. And I knew from my anatomy, the spear was pretty darn close to my femoral artery. So I had one choice, or two choices eventually, is either shove the spear completely through my leg and out the other side, or pull it back out. So the tip was sticking out the bottom side of my thigh, so I decided to push the spear on through and out the bottom. And as I started to push, the pain was intense. And I said, man, I don't want to do that. I'm going to pull this thing out, hooks and all. So I held my breath, and I jerked that spear right out of my leg. And when that came out of my leg, the blood shot straight in the air, and I could count my heartbeats with the blood spurt. Instantly, I jumped out of the tree. I got down on the ground, and I started to take my boots off because I had to get my, my, uh, my laces out of my boots so I could make a tourniquet but the blood was coming so fast and I could feel myself getting lightheaded and I knew I was about to pass out and I knew once I passed out I wasn't waking up so I grabbed my leg with all I had and I pressed on the wound the best I could and I could not stop the bleeding I knew my femoral artery must have been been cut so the next thing I did I, I put these two fingers as deep as I could in the hole and then finally I could feel the squirt against my fingers every time my heart would beat and I pressed as hard as I could, and I tried and tried to stay awake. Every time the heart would beat, I could feel it squirt around my finger. It was terrible. But at that moment, I said to myself, I live for this moment. My whole life, I've wanted to do this. I've wanted to be in the wild, making my living. So I turned on my cameras. <laughs> and film myself die. <laughs> but I decided I didn't want to die. I knew I was in peril, but as I held my finger on the, the artery that was nicked, eventually I fought, I fought the feeling of wanting to sleep off, and I came out of shock. And when I came out of shock, I was okay. But every time I'd pull my hand out, the blood would come back, so I had to keep it on that artery. But over about two hours, finally, I slowed it down enough that I could get a tourniquet on it. 
and I made it out of there alive. But I had to lay in the forest for about eight hours until they finally started looking for me. Because I told them it was my last day in Africa. I said, don't be driving in here looking for me or coming to get me till I radio, because this is my last day. And the one day that they do what I actually told them was that day. So when I got home, when I got back to camp, a doctor, they, they flew a doctor in there, and uh, I was weak. I had lost a lot of blood. Uh, the first thing he wanted to do was take me to the nearby village where there was a, a place that they wanted to give me a, a blood transfusion. And I, at that point, I was more afraid of AIDS than anything else. I didn't want to have a blood transfusion, so I knew I'd live that long. I was going to make it home. I said, no, just fly me home. Well, the doctor, I guess he was a doctor. I haven't talked to the guy since, but instead of flushing the wound like you would in the, you know, a real situation where they would put a hose in there and flush out the wound, that was the same spear that I had killed two other animals with. It had blood, hair, dirt, poop, everything on it, and it had just gone through my leg. He flushed, he wiped off the spear on the top and on the bottom and sewed the hole shut and sewed everything inside. So the next day when I got off the plane, I couldn't walk on my leg. And when the doctor peeled the jeans off of me, I was black from my hip to my foot. And the only thing that saved my leg was the doctor had given me some drugs that were illegal, but they were so powerful that they actually, the, my doctor at home said, they probably kept you from dying. And so uh, it took a while, but now I'm strong like bull. I do have, a, uh, when it gets cold, uh, my, my right foot goes to sleep a little faster than my left, but uh, I'm good to go. But there's risk involved when you, you give it 100%. And, uh, but I knew that going into it. And when I look back, I'll do it again. So, you know, I was asked to talk tonight a little bit about the business side of what I do and how I got there. And I would say that there's one thing I would like to show you. There was a pivotal point where the success really took off. And I would say that was a moment where uh, I had an idea. And uh, once my sh I, I began winning these awards and I knew that, hey, man, I had made it in the hunting industry and I was going to be able to hunt for a living the rest of my life. I, was, I had met that goal and I had... I had, I had found my dream come true, but now I was going to go a step further. And I had an idea because at the time I had uh, Bass Pro, Cabela's, uh, Ford, um, Mossy Oak, all the big sponsors were, my, were behind me. And I wanted to do something that was really going to be powerful. And I, and I decided to take a chance. And uh, I said, okay, I'm going to go for it. And uh, I built a commercial. And I spent the money on it, and I said, this is going to change the hunting industry. There was a new company that called Rage Broadheads. And Rage Broadheads is the, that's a Rage is, goes on the tip of the arrow. It's the biggest company in uh, the broadhead industry in, in archery. And they sponsored me. And I said, I'm going to build them a commercial that not only will make them a lot of money, but it will build my brand, and it will create a buzz around Relentless Pursuit in Tim Wells. And so I built the commercial and I spent a lot of money on it. But when the commercial aired, three months later, I got a call from the Rage owner at the time. Recently, he sold his company for $120 million and he's retired now, but at the time it wasn't worth that much. But he called me and he said, Tim, that is the multi-million dollar commercial he goes, I have made more money since your commercial has aid than I, than I ever could have dreamed. And that's what began something really great for me. And if you want to play that Rage commercial so they, they can see what I'm talking about here. Um, it would be Caveman Commercials. Okay, this is uh, the second commercial that aired after I did the rage. This is my prehistoric stuff. That is Jared Allen with me.
So that was my scent killer commercial. Now comes the rage commercial. It was a lot of fun making that commercial too. Okay, let's show the, so anyway, after that commercial aired, it wasn't four or five months that I started getting other calls. The big companies were calling and they wanted to be part of the, the caveman craze. So let's try the uh, Buck Forge. This is the largest uh, Buck How long did it take to make Buck Forge the most preferred food plot? There, they go way. <laughs> so that was a good thing for me, and uh, that pretty much sealed the deal. And that's at that point I knew there was no looking, looking back. I had made it. It was a good feeling. But then there came another we have talked about. Sometimes you have to get up when you fall down. I said to myself, man, I'm the master of this game. I can do anything. These apps are pretty cool, and kids really like them. I said, I'm going to build a hunting app. And I got to looking and got to talking and got a consultant. Next thing I knew, oh, it was only $250,000 to build one. I thought, hmm. He said, oh, but you can make millions with apps. They're, they're the new hot thing. Well, I learned another lesson then. He said, never believe the salesman 100% if you don't know the guy. And uh, so I took a, took a, a big chance and let's, uh, let's, I did have a really good commercial though, and this is the T-Rex the Hunter app. The first day the, the commercial aired to sell the app, the downloads began by the hundreds of thousands probably. It was an unbelievable. If you search for food, there's a nurse called Dr. Sue Hunter. Dr. So it was a really good app and the commercial was awesome. They started to download like crazy, but I had left out one little detail, at least the app builder had. They didn't the app didn't work on the phones very good. And the new phones uh, wouldn't work, play, and next thing I know, it was an avalanche of bad press. And to make a long story short, the whole app idea died and down went my investment. So once again, I had to get back up and, and fight again. So life's tough. It's out there to be had. There's always a new opportunity, and there's always a new way to lose your ass if you don't know what you're doing. So protect your success once you get there. Because as quick as you got there, it can basically go away. But uh, hey, I appreciate you having me here. I attribute Monmouth College to much of my success. And uh, it's good to see the hungry faces in the crowd and some of the other faces from farm boys and countrymen like myself that have come out. I appreciate you all showing up. I wish you the best. Absolutely. Tim, thank you so much for, for being with us tonight. Those were wonderful lessons, wonderful stories. And to show our, our pride in all that you've accomplished and to express our appreciation for you being with us tonight, I want to present you with one of our highest honors, the Scotsman Statue. Wow, thank you so much. So we want to come over here and... and uh, Stand
Thank you, everybody. All right, Tim has time for just a few questions, so if you've, uh, if you've got some, please go ahead. What do you got, buddy? What's the craziest hunt you ever had? <laughs> craziest, okay. Um, well, I was in Mozambique, and uh, I was hunting Cape Buffalo. And the Cape Buffalo, are, they're a dangerous animal. They will kill you if they can. And they're about a 2,000 pound animal. They got these big sweeping horns. And I wanted to be the first guy to ever spear one. So the, I, the, the, the natives that I was working with didn't speak English very well, but we kind of communicated. But the, to make a long story short, we ended up where there was some buffalo. And I couldn't see the buffalo because there was grass probably that tall. I mean, it was high. And the buffalo would feed there in midday, and they would waller in the mud and so forth. And the, the natives told me that they would push the buffalo to me. I hadn't experienced this before, so I, you know, I had visions of buffalo walking out of the grass and looking around, and I was going to spear one when they came out. Sounded like a great deal. So they set me up, and they said they would come through this area right here. Well, when they said they would come, I instantly realized, oh, there's going to be more than one. Uh, so I'm waiting with my single spear hiding in the brush. You know, I had my camera ran back behind me, and... Uh, they went out around and they were gone for a long time. You know, we were waiting. It was 110 degrees out. It was terrible, hot and sweating, not expecting much. But suddenly the, I heard a, a, a real loud rumbling sound. And the louder it got, the wider eyed my cameraman behind me began. You know, he was like, what is coming? And next thing I knew, I could see the grass. It was starting to rumble and coming my way, but only it was like a wave, and it was coming, and it was, it was white as the campus. There must have been 150 buffalo in this giant herd, and they're all man killers, and they're coming at 40 mile an hour, and I'm ready with a spear. <laughs> and so I, at this point, it, it turned into uh, self-defense. It wasn't a hunt, you know. I, I backed myself up in, in the weeds. There was no trees to climb. There was no holes to get in. And I looked back, and my cameraman said, screw this. And he was running as fast as he could trying to get to the river. And the, out they came. They come blowing through the grass. They were going every side of me. Big buffalo. I mean, huge ones with big horns. I didn't even think about throwing at one of them. I just wanted to survive. And finally, one come running and just blew out of the grass at me. And when he saw me, he just put his head down. And I jumped one way. And he veered and went right around me. Oh, that was probably one of the craziest hunts I've ever been on. But I had another one that was pretty close to that. I was in Namibia with... Uh, a, a young guy that was, he was crazy. Everywhere we went, he wanted to play with the, the, the poisonous snakes. He'd tease them, and he was constantly teasing them. This story doesn't end up funny. But he, he took me uh, one day, and we were hunting, and he said, do you want to film a buff or a, a, an elephant? I said, oh, that would be great, a wild elephant, you know? Yeah. And in the distance, we could see this elephant shaking a tree. He was trying to break limbs off it to eat. It was a big bull. And sure enough, we trekked over there, and he didn't have his gun with him or nothing. And we got, oh, we were probably about 75 yards from the buffalo. It was my PH, his little tracker. They were young, little guys, but agile. And uh, me with, and I had a camera with me at the time. I wasn't going to kill an a, a elephant. I was going to film it. So I'm filming it, and I'm like, oh, wow, this is cool. I can do this for like a cutaway on my show. In Africa, there's elephants and whatever. And all of a sudden, that elephant went, and turned and faced us. And I was like, <coughs> I was like, oh, this is cool. He's got his ears out and everything. And all of a sudden, Woo! here he come. And he was coming full speed. And I was getting it all on film. And I was like, this is great. And I looked over to Erevan and he was gone too. He was running. And the little guy that was right beside me, he was running too. And I was the only one left filming. Next thing I know, this, this elephant is 25 yards, and he's screaming, and he's coming at me, and he's not going to stop. This is no, I, I, if I ever knew a fake charge, this wasn't one of them. And I turned and took off running, and the faster I ran, the louder it got behind me. And I could hear every step of that elephant's foot. And just like in the movies, he was going, Bruh! Bruh! 
Oh, and, and that just, I mean, that kicked it up a level. I was running fast. Roger, if I could have ran like that for you, you'd have been so proud. You would have, I mean, I would have been something. But anyway, I got into the thick stuff and I started going. And I can tell you that the funny part of the story was the little guy that was ahead of me. I'll never forget, I was actually catching up to him, but the elephant was coming through the heavy brush, and I rem he tripped, and when he fell down in front of me, I was like, yes, and I ran past him. But eventually, as I was running, here he come back by me with the elephant on our tail. And to make a long story short, we got away. The elephant gave up on us. But when you are chased by something that wants to kill you, there's nothing like that. When it was over, we stood around. We were looking at each other, laughing, not out of funniness, but that is just how you react. It's like, oh my gosh, we're all alive. We were laughing and you know, slapping each other. It was crazy that we had almost been killed by an elephant. And uh, when an elephant's behind you pounding the ground, it was something. But you know, my pH was very reckless. And he, I, I was old enough to know that playing with these, these, uh, these, these cobras and things that, that we came across and the black mambas and these, these vipers, that was dangerous. And that, you know, there's a place where you face your fear, but there's a place where you have a little common sense. So you have, he wasn't, and he never got bit, but he liked to play with danger. And he had been around elephants his whole life, and he knew that this elephant was going to chase us. And he thought it was funny that it chased the old man that was filming him. One year later, his mom called me, and they found Erevan dead from the elephants. And she said that when they found his body, that it was as big around as a car hood, flat, like a pancake on the ground where the, the elephants had trampled him into the ground. No one knows what happened, but I know what happened. He was probably teasing those wild animals because that's what he loved to do, you know? And so that's kind of a wild story for you. It's true, though. Anybody else? The grizzly bear with the spear or with the bow? So the grizzly bear was... Uh, you know, that was one of my first video that I captured of a, of a big game animal. Uh, and uh, to you know, make a long story short, but back it up to when I owned my quick lube business, the man that bought my quick lube oil changes came to me and he said he made me the offer, and it was a good offer. And I could tell he was very rich. And so I said, I'll do the deal, but you got to buy me a bear hunt in Alaska. And he's like, Okay, we'll do it. And he had no idea what a grizzly bear hunt cost, but anyway, uh, he threw that in the deal. So that's how I got my bear hunt, and I was thrilled. I went up there with my dad, and you know, I found the be the bear ten days into the hunt. It was the first bear I'd ever seen, it, and it was a huge one, a huge grizzly bear. I told this story at dinner tonight, but anyway, we'll leave out the blueberries. But. Uh, <clears throat> I ran down to this, this little ridge where the bear was below it, you know, several hundred yards, and this huge bear, he was walking along and he was feeding in the blueberries. He was com coming across and the wind was blowing downhill. And I needed to get ahead of the bear before he got my wind because there, brown bears in Alaska, or grizzly bears are very spooky of humans. They run when they smell you. And so I, I hurried down the mountain and I got, I got ahead of him and as, just as I got ahead of him enough, he, the wind hit him. But by that time, I realized, oh my gosh, I've ran in too close. I'm almost close enough he can kill me now. And when I did that, I drew my bow back. And at the moment I drew my bow, he turned and looked at me and went, whoa. And as he did that, I focused on his eyes. I was like, oh my gosh, his head was that big around. And he was looking right at me. And I could just sense that this bear was about to come. And at that moment, I let her fly. Now, I shoot a bow and arrow with no sights on it, a lot like the Indians used to do. It's called instinctive. And the arrow, if you're a really good shot, you no longer aim. If you're really good at instinctive, you just your brain grabs the arrow, and you just look, and you let it go, and it goes where it should go. It's like Bootsy throwing a football back in the day. I mean, he didn't evaluate how deep we were or anything like that. He just backed up. There's the open guy, and he lets it rip, and the ball goes where it's supposed to. The arrow does the same thing. 
But when it left my bow, I said to myself, oh, crap, I've aimed at the bear's head, not his vitals. And when the arrow struck the bear, it struck him right where I was looking, right between the eyes. And the arrow cracked his skull, and when it went into his skull, it sheared both the blades off the broadhead, but the arrow continued, and it went right through his brain and lodged dead center in his spinal cord. And the bear flopped down and never wiggled. He was dead on impact, a giant bear. And when I came back to camp, my dad was in camp, and we picked up the camera, and he looked in the lens, and when he pulled his head out, he goes, Tim, that shot will be heard around the world. <laughs> and to this day, it's one of the most fascinating video clips that everybody asks me about. And they always say, is that where you were aiming? And I always say, that's between me and the bear. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. So, uh, you always post about Big Louie. Yeah, Big Louie, man. People ask me who's Big Louie, and they like to ask me, what's Schlock mean? Well, Big Louie is always what, when I was a kid, we would always hunt Big Louie in the forest. When we were little boys, my neighbor boy and I, and my dog, we would be. We named the, the big buck Big Louie. Well, it just kind of caught on, and so I called every deer Big Louie. Instead of all the other hunters, they have a name for every deer. Every deer is Big Louie with us, and that's why you see me calling him Big Louie. The other thing is they call me the slock master because when I was a kid, I liked to throw spears, and when that spear would hit in the mud when I was throwing at the fish, it would go... And so all my friends, they started calling me the slock master, and it stuck. And now I own slockmaster.com. It, <laughs> it is the largest primitive hunting weapon website in the world. And I'm about to launch my new blowgun. And I'm pretty excited about that. But, you know, one, some, there's a lot of people on the internet, you know, on Facebook and Instagram that like you, and then there's a lot of them that don't like you, you know, especially when you're killing innocent animals. So. Uh, one guy had the audacity to look up slocking in the, in, the, in, the, in the dictionary. I'd never thought about looking up slocking because I'm the slock master. And he sent me the definition on the message when all my fans were reading my, my, my mail, and it said, slocking, a male who goes into the bathroom to expose himself to other people. <laughs> so I'm the slock master. Take it for what it is. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live with it, but... So, it, uh, yeah. Did you impart all this to your daughter in her successful way? So Sydney uh, is, uh, I'm very proud of Sydney. Sydney, since she was that little, was slinging arrows with me. And she loves bow hunting probably more than I do. And uh, Barstool Sports, you guys probably know all about them. That's a pretty big deal. Uh, I'd never heard of them until Sydney told me about it. But uh, they opened a division an application for someone to do what Sydney does uh, for Barstool Outdoors. It's a division of their company. And Sydney uh, said, Dad, I'm going I'm to try to get that job. And I said, Sydney, you know, being protective, I said, you know, they're, the, the, they're all from New York, you know, and then when they find out I'm your dad, you're not going to get the job, but, you know, you, you go ahead and try if you can. And there was uh, 15,000 applications. And somehow Sydney come in my room jumping up and down like she was, you know, a kindergartner again, just got a free popsicle. She was freaking out because she had got the job. And uh, she hasn't looked back. She's doing a great job. She's hunting all over the world and uh, she's living her dream. And she didn't have to work for it for 25 years like I did, but she's there already and I'm really proud of her. That's one of the benefits of success when you're old is that you can share that success with your children and your family, whether it be money, uh, land, you know, buy a new car for your kid, or maybe you know, give them a little better education. That's one of the benefits. And Sydney had the the you know the tenacity to to put her application in with Barstool, and and she went for it. I had always taught Sydney and Clint, you go for it. There's nothing in this world that you can't do. 
and uh, obviously Sydney had learned a lot hunting with me and uh, she was pretty articulate and good with the camera and uh, by golly she got the job. I'm pretty proud of her. Did your mom and dad live long enough to see your success? Oh yeah, my mom is dying right now with cancer but she's uh, lived a great life. Uh, my dad, he's still doing good and uh, he's just matter of fact uh, built a log cabin with him in the woods close to our house and he loves that and I came home the other day and drove down and by golly he had taken the tractor and pulled the whole porch off the, the cabin and he's building a new one on there so he's 82 years old and he's going strong but mom's not doing so well but she's going to heaven when when she's out of here and uh, I'll, I'll hang out with her when I get up there. Well, I think we heard a lot of great words tonight, a lot of great advice, but uh, for me, the ones that really stick out are be ready to show the world what you can do. Absolutely. Great example. Yep. Thank you, guys.